All right, this is our final final lecture on Castle of Otranto by Horace Walpole and Professor Milsom. And um, we're going to finish this book. We're going to go over a few of the key terms that we've learned while reading it that you need to know, or at least having your notes, and um, go over some of the characters. Uh, spoiler alert, I'm going to give you all the details of the plot. This is a plot with many plot twists, so if you haven't finished, um, well, you're about to learn all the dirty secrets hidden within the walls of the Castle of Otranto. I wanted to bring you back to the first lecture I did, Introduction to Walpole, and show you, this is a picture of me, um, I visited Walpole's house, and this is at his house, um, some of these objects are just replacements for the ones he himself owned because a lot were sold but at the top of his stairs he has a helmet and you'll see peeking up here the sable plumes on the helmet now in in, the, in our novel of course the helmet was a hundred times the size of this but um this is what sable plumes you can look like look like black feathers on top of a helmet and this is sitting outside in the hallway at Horace Walpole's house so imagine this was the decoration in your home you can tell I was very excited um all right oh I left that picture on there that is not helpful um but anyway this is uh just to review the notes from chapter one you'll have uh, this slideshow available to you on our blackboard page castle this is uh, chapter two notes chapter three here we are chapter four um, the all the words of the prophecy are going to come true remember um, at the beginning on the first page flip back first page of the story that the castle and lordship of Otranto should pass from the present family whenever the real owner should be grown too large to inhabit it. Well, so the pre the real owner um, is being represented by these enlarged uh, pieces of armor. We've had the helmet, we've seen the leg and the foot, um, there's a huge sword, and on the enormous saber, or sword, that's a word you need to know by now, saber, there are the words, wherever, where'er, see there's an apostrophe there that's replacing the V, that's what apostrophes do, as opposed to apostrophe, the literary term, which is when you are addressing something that cannot respond. Um, but anyway, the, the prophecy on the sword is, wherever a cask, helmet, that suits this sword is found, with perils is thy daughter compassed around. Alfonso's blood alone can save the maid, maid it means virgin, and quiet a long restless prince's shade. So this is a saber that Frederick, Duke of Vicenza, father of Isabella, found. And it says, wherever you find a helmet that is the same size as this sword, or suits it, huge. wherever you find a huge helmet, that's where your daughter is in danger perils is thy daughter compassed around she's surrounded by danger and then alfonso's blood alone can save the maid only someone possessing blood of alfonso can save her and quiet the long restless prince's shade so this curse will only be resolved once um the daughter uh is saved by someone with alfonso's blood now we know frederick is related to Alfonso, but we learn in the next chapter that, in fact, Theodore is the direct descendant. Theodore is the grandson of the Prince of Otranto, so he has to save Isabella. Okay, so also in this chapter, we see a lot of things come to the surface, a lot of taboos. Um, a taboo is something that is forbidden by morality or religion, things like incest or violence. These are taboos. Taboos are also like things you're not supposed to bring up at the dinner table. You know, uh, when you go to a family event, it's taboo to speak of, like, the family secrets, or some people think it's taboo to talk about politics. 
in this case, the taboo is fathers marrying their daughters. And we get, um, we hear about the nasty double marriage idea, which is where Manfred and Frederick decide like Manfred's going to marry Isabella and Frederick's going to marry Matilda and it's nasty. Um, so we'll get to that. There's a family secrets and secret connections. We learned Theodore's backstory. He had been a slave until saved recently and then uh, came ashore where he could save Isabella. We learn about some deception happening. Isabella tries for a second to deceive Matilda so she can get Theo. Um, in the end, as we learn, Isabella does get Theo because Matilda gets killed. Sorry, plot, plot, spoiler there. Um, and then there's continued no supernatural events. We have the my favorite supernatural event in all of literature, which is the, the nosebleed. Um, Alfonso's statue gets a bloody nose when Manfred says, quote, Frederick accepts Matilda's hand and is content to waive his claim unless I have no male issue. So right when Manfred and Frederick are about to agree to like this double marriage and um, give up the quest for uh, righteousness, that's when the statue's like, oh, hell no, and gets a nosebleed. Um, the statue will not rest, as we see up here, restless. The restless Prince Alfonso from the dead is like, oh, hell no, revenge will be had, and my statue's getting a nosebleed. So, so goofy. Okay, finally, chapter five. Again, always mistaken identity. Um, remember back when he was guarding the cave, he was protecting the virgin in the hole with his long, phallic, penis-like sword. Remember, he stabbed Frederick, thinking he was Manfred or out to get Matilda. Or, I mean, uh, Isabella. So Theo was protecting Isabella and accidentally stabs and almost kills her father. He doesn't die, but, you know, it's ironic because they're both on the same side at that point. And then another... Mistaken identity in chapter five, a lot of stabbing happening. Manfred stabs Matilda, thinking he can prevent, um, thinking she's Isabella, and he just would rather kill Isabella than let her marry Theodore. But turns it, she turns around, and oops, it's his daughter. Whoops. And, you know, as a result, he's he feels so guilty because he's such a Miltonic villain. He's evil, but he feels guilt. So, um he decides to become a monk at the end and um there's again more supernatural events we've got a giant hand that appears to bianca when she goes um, bribed by manfred to find out what isabella thinks of theodore so she gets bribed um because manfred's like so what does isabella think of theodore and then a giant hand appears to her so we've got another body part um, there's going to be a praying skeleton in a hermit's cowl. A hermit's cowl is like one of those robes that monks wear. And Frederick, who's drunk, comes in to Hippolyta's room to convince her to divor divorce Manfred. Um, and the prophecy is against it. And instead of seeing Hippolyta play praying, he sees a skeleton. It's very spooky. Um, and then the moment that... Theodore reappears in the castle after Matilda has died. This is great. Quote, the walls of the castle behind Man Manfred fall down. And quote, the form, oops, the form of Alfonso dilated, that means stretched to an immense magnitude, appears in the rubble. So the wall falls down. We've got mega Alfonso, I call him. It says, quote, behold in Theodore, the true heir of Alfonso. This is what Mega Alfonso says. And then, accompanied by a clap of thunder, Alfonso goes up to heaven and meets with St. Nicholas. So finally, Alfonso can rest because the true prince of Otranto has been victorious. Um, great scene. So again, here's the picture. We've got Otranto over here. We've got St. Nicholas in the convent. Um, underground subterraneous passage. We've got... Frederick of Vicenza here with his mega sword. We've got Theodore helping Matilda at the beginning. Father Jerome over here. Conrad under under the helmet here. Anyway, this oh over here now you know what this is. This is the hole 
the cave where Matilda was hi hiding. This is the princess running around the forest. It all comes clear. Here's the professor who is coming after me erasing my board. Thanks for that. Okay, and so I wanted to also go over the secret histories of these characters um, just to clear, clear it up because there's a lot of confusing stories. I think the first time I read this, I was just like, whatever, this is too confusing. But just so you don't feel that way and you can write this down. Manfred, his father, Don Ricardo, was the chamberlain, which is like the manager or secretary, for Alfonso a couple generations ago. So Manfred's grandfather was Alfonso's servant, essentially, high-level servant, like his assistant. Okay, Don Ricardo, when they were away at the Crusades, poisoned Alfonso and went back and stole the castle and claimed Alfonso had given it. But here we learn Don Ricardo actually poisoned him. Now remember, the Crusades is a big thing. Back in the Middle Ages, the Holy Land, which is like the Middle East, it's like still wars going on there over all this property. Um, like Jerusalem, Israel, Palestine, that's the Holy Land for Christians, for Jews, and for Muslims. And um, so everyone's always fighting over it. So back in the 11th through 15th centuries, remember that's 10 hundreds through 14 hundreds, um, there were European Christians going over there to fight the Muslims. And that was a way you could become like a famous knight. So go kill some Muslims in the Holy Land and you could be um, famous and have a lot of honor. As you can see, history really just really does repeat itself, doesn't it? Um, anyway, over in, the, over in the Crusades, that's where Alfonso died from poisoning from his personal assistant, Manfred's grandpa. That's why Alfonso could not rest. All right, the peasant from the first chapters we know now is Theodore, a.k.a. Um, the son of Father Jerome, and his mother was Alfonso's daughter. That's what we learn at the end of the book. His mother, um, Alfonso's daughter, uh, and Father Jerome had Theodore. So he's the grandson of Alfonso, which is why he looks like the painting of Alfonso. Got it? So he's the direct descendant of Alfonso. Now, the knight who showed up early on in the book with the big parade that we learn is Frederick, Duke of Vicenza, a.k.a. Isabella's father. And um, he is the... So Frederick... Um, Isabella's father was related to Alfonso, which is why he's going over there to protect the castle from Manfred. Um, but Theodore is the direct descendant. Um, but Isabella is technically related to Alfonso distantly, which is why Frederick wanted her to marry, um, wanted Vicenza's daughter to marry his daughter Matilda. No, I wrote this wrong. Oh my gosh, this is funny. I wrote Manfred wanted Vincenza's daughter to marry his daughter Matilda. No, he, he was not proposing a lesbian marriage between Matilda and Isabel. He was proposing a marriage between Vincenza's um, daughter Isabella and his son Conrad. Duh. Um, but when Conrad is killed, well, this is like or, that would be some good fan fiction, wouldn't it? If. Uh, we had Isabella and Matilda get married. That would be a good rewriting of this. Actually, if you guys want to write some fan fiction about Otranto, that would be a really acceptable, um, fun assignment. Anyway, that's why Manfred wanted Vicenza's daughter to marry his son Conrad, so he would legitimately have um, someone from Alfonso's family in his own family, and that's why he wants to marry Isabella so badly once Conrad is killed, because then he'd at least be related, or marrying someone who's related to Alfonso. All right, and then I just wanted to put this up here and have you know this. Um, you might want to pause the video here and take some notes or check out the slideshow. Um, 
but we have all the key terms. I've sort of gone through my notes. We've got supernatural machinery. This is just a technical term in literature referring to creatures that move the plot along, like supernatural creatures. Sterility is a word in this case, in this context, for infertility. Virility is manly strength. It's also the ability to reproduce. Whence is an old-fashioned term. Most people don't get this right, but it means from where. Whence did you come? It means like, where did you get, come from? It doesn't mean when. Sable is black. Plumes are feathers, so the sable plumes on the helmet, on the cask. Oh, I should have put cask on here. You have to know cask. Air, E-R-E, -E, it means before. It's an old-fashioned term, pronounced air. You see it a lot in Shakespeare, um, but we've had it a couple times. It's helpful to know. Usurper is someone who illegally takes a position of power. Taboo, we just went over. Miltonic villain is the type of villain who resembles the devil from John Milton's Paradise Lost. Very famous text um, in English literature. And it's a complicated villain, right? He's evil and proud, but he also always feels guilty. He's like a guilty bad guy, you know. Someone who feels bad about all his sins. And at the end, Manfred feels really bad because he's killed his daughter and he's messed everything up um you could also argue it's kind of not his fault like he inherited this mess i mean he's obviously evil but he ends up as a monk he and hippolyta end up taking the veil going and praying for the rest of their lives and i think manfred has a lot to pray about you got the word tempest which is a fancy word for storm remember the sable plumes billow tempestuously whenever Manfred does something that the ghost of Alfonso doesn't like. We've got saber, it's a type of sword. It's this kind of sword, the, the round one. Think saber-toothed tiger. They have like these sort of rounded teeth. That's a saber. Phallic, I used that word to describe the imagery of Theodore guarding the cave, the holes. Phallic is like a term, it's a very Freudian term. It's like penis-like things or phallic objects. So swords are phallic objects. Chivalric romance came up before. These were adventures of heroic knights who protect virgins. These were popular in the Middle Ages and highly influential to this day. I mean, this is like a theme in a lot of literature. You have the chivalry of the knight who protects the virgins without caring about what he gets in, in return. It's a very noble cause. Non-rapey men who protect women from rape. Um, and then just, I referenced this before, the Crusades, the holy wars between European Christians and Muslims in the Holy Land. Centuries of fighting. Crusaders were people like, um, you know, the Duke of Vicenza, Frederick, and uh, Alfonso. This is how you went and got honor back in those days. Um, okay, so... That's there for you in the slideshow. Let's go over here to look at some passages before we conclude our time here with the beloved characters. So I wanted you to look at chapter, we're on chapter four, page 82. I was trying to experiment with typing here. So what has just happened is that Isabel tried for a second to convince Matilda that Theo didn't love her, but Matilda is like so nice. She's like, Okay, you can have it. Look at the top here. May you be happy, Isabella, whatever the fate, whatever is the fate of Matilda. And then Isabella's like, oh, my lovely friend whose heart was too honest to resist a kind, of, uh, kind expression. It is you that Theodore admires. I saw it. She's like, oh, sorry, Theo really loves you. And then this frankness, like this honesty, frank, frank is a term that means honesty. This frankness this is a good word to know, big vocab. Drew tears from the gentle Matilda and jealousy that for a moment had raised a coolness between these amiable ma maidens. Like, for a moment, there was a lot of jealousy, but uh, it soon gave way to a natural sincerity and candor of the souls. So it's, they're like, oh, we really love each other sincerely. And candor means honesty. So this honesty, like, reminded them of the honesty honest love they felt between each other and they each confessed to the other the impression that Theodore had made on her they're like oh isn't he hot isn't he noble and this confidence was struggle followed by a struggle of generosity each 
each insisting on yielding her claim to her friend. She's like, no, you have him. No, you have him. No, you have him. Which is um, sad because, you know, in a few pages, as you know, Matilda, who Theo really loves, or I mean, yeah, Matilda. God, it's so easy to mix them up. I always remember Matilda is Manfred's daughter and they both begin with M. That's how I remember it, by the way. So as we know, Matilda's about to die, even though, and even though Theodore loves her, he and Isabella decide to get married at the end, at the very end, because they're the only ones who understand each other's pain by this point. Okay, so here they are. Oh no, you have him, you have him. At length, the dignity of Isabella's virtue, reminding her of the preference which Theodore had almost declared for her rival. She's like, he really does love Matilda. This made her determined to conquer her passion and seed, give the beloved object to her friend. So Theodore here is the beloved object. Don't you love that? He's an object now. All right, this is the part um, that's really getting dark here. Okay. During this contest of amity, amity is like friendship, Hippolyta entered her daughter's chamber. Madam, she said to Isabella, you have so much tenderness for Matilda and interest yourself so kindly in whatever affects our house, a wretched house, that I can have no secrets with my child which are not proper for you to hear. So Hippolyta is about to confess something. The princesses were all attention and anxiety. Know then, madam, continued Hippolyta, that you and you, my dearest Matilda, that being convinced of, convinced by all the events of these last, these two last ominous, threatening days, that heaven purposes the scepter. A scepter is like the thing that a ruler holds in his hand or her hands. It's like a thing with a ball at the top like this. Not, not a lollipop, but, um, you know, they hold this. It's like a symbol of royalty. There's like a hand. I wish you guys could, I had a better drawer than this, but anyway. Okay. Heaven purposes the scepter of Otranto should pass from Manfred's hands into those of the Marquis of Frederick. So Hippolyta here is like acknowledging reality. She's like, Manfred is not going to be a king or a prince much longer. I, and she says, I have been perhaps inspired with the thought of averting, de like deterring our total destruction by the union of our rival houses. So she's like, I think I can save everyone. With this view, I have been proposing to Manfred, my lord, to tender this dear child to Frederick, your father. What? She's like, in order to save our collapse, she's like, I've decided Matilda should marry Frederick. Remember, Matilda's in love with Theodore here. Can you imagine? Me? To Lord Frederick? Cried Matilda. Good heavens, my gracious mother. And have you named it to my father? I have, said Hippolyta. He listened benignly to my proposal and is going to break it to the Marquis. She's like, oh my God. Ah, oh, wretch. And then Isabella, learning that Matilda was about to be forced to marry her dad. Ah, oh, wretched princess, cried Isabella. What hast thou done? What ruin has thy inadvertent goodness been preparing for thyself, for me and for Matilda? She's like, why are you going to make your daughter marry my dad? Ruin from me to you and to my child, said Hippolyta. What can this mean? Alas, said Isabella, the purity of your own heart prevents you from seeing the depravity of others. She's like, you're so pure that you can't even see how evil people are. Manfred, your lord, that impious man, your husband, hold, said Hippolyta, you must not in my depend... Oh, what? Did I skip a page? Where's page 83? Hang on a second, pause. Okay, here we are back to page 82, 83, bottom of 82. So Isabella is called Manfred impious and depraved. And then Hippolyta goes, hold on, said Hippolyta. You must not, in my presence, young lady, mention Manfred with disrespect. She's like, take my man's name out of your mouth. Oops. He is my lord and husband and ugh, will not long be so, said Isabella, if his wicked purposes can be carved into ex execution. Isabel's like, your husband is the worst. This language amazes me, said Hippolyta. Your feeling, Isabella, is warm, but until this hour, I never knew it betray you into intemperance. Okay, after all this, Hippolyta is still defending Manfred. Can you believe this? 
What deed of Manfred authorizes you to treat him as a murderer and assassin? And then Isabel's like, oh, thou, thou virtuous and too credulous princess. Too credulous meaning like you believe things too easily, replied Isabella. It is not thy life he aims at. It is to separate himself from me, thee, from you, to divorce you. To, to divorce me? To divorce my mother, cried Hippolyta and Matilda both at once. Like, they didn't realize this at this point? Yes, said Isabella, and to complete his crime, he meditates. Oh, I cannot even speak it. Meditates means thinks. What can surpass what thou hast already uttered, said Matilda. Hippolyta was silent. Grief choked her speech. And the recollection of Manfred's late ambiguous discourses, like confusing things he said, confirmed what she heard. Excellent, dear lady, madam, mother, cried Isabella, flinging herself at Hippolyta's feet in a transport of passion. Trust me, believe me, I will die a thousand deaths sooner than consent to injure you, and then yield so odious that means hateful. Oh, this is too much, cried Hippolyta. What crimes does one suggest? Rise, dear Isabella, I do not doubt your virtue. Oh, Matilda, this stroke is too heavy for me. Weep not, my child, and not a murmur. I charge thee, remember he is thy father still. She's like, remember, he's still your father. <laughs> but you are my mother too, said Matilda. Matilda's like, yeah, but you're my mom, and this is terrible. She goes, and you are virtuous. You are guiltless. So this is like the women are like, oh my God, I didn't realize how bad this man was. Okay. So what? how does she resolve this? Oh, must I not? Must not I, must not I complain? You must not, said Hippolyta. Come, all will be well, yet yet will be well. Manfred, in the agony for the loss of thy brother, knew not what he said. She's like, he was just sad your brother died. Perhaps Isabella misunderstood him. His heart is good. Look, she's still trying. I don't know. Come on, Hippolyta. And my child, thou knowest not all. There is a destiny hangs over us. The hand of providence, that means like destiny or God, is stretched out. Oh, could I but save thee from the wreck? Yes, continued she in a firmer tone. Perhaps the sacrifice of myself may atone for all. Ugh, I know. I will go and offer myself to this divorce. It boots not what becomes of me. She's like, it doesn't matter what comes of me. I will withdraw into the neighboring monastery and waste the remainder of life in prayers and tears for my child and the prince. This is what they all want to do secretly, is just go to the monastery where they can be safe, right? She's like, I'll divorce him. Yeah, I'll, I'll become a nun. I'll just... Spend waste the rest of my life praying. It actually sounds pretty good compared to all this. And then Isabella, thou art as much too good for this world, said Ma Isabella, as Manfred is ex execrable. It's a hard word to say, execrable. It means hateful. But think not, lady, that thy weakness shall determine for me. I swear, hear me, ye angels. Stop, I adjure thee, cried Hippolyta. Remember thou dost not depend on thyself. Thou hast a father. Ugh, oh, my father, interrupted Isabella, my father, Vicenza, is too pious, too noble, interrupted Isabella, to command an impious deed. But should he command it, can a father enjoin a cursed act? I was contracted to the son. Can I wed the father? No, madam, no. Force should not drag me to Manfred's hated bed. I loathe him. I abhor him. Divine and human laws forbid. She's like human. I, I'm like technically his daughter, basically. So that's against the law. And my friend, my dearest Matilda, I wo would I wound her tender soul by injuring her adored mother? I can't marry my friend's dad, my own mother. I never have known another. Oh, she is the mother of both, cried Matilda. Can we, can we, Isabella, adore her too much? Oh, my lovely. This is like a scene of like female affection and love. She's like, you're my only mother, the only mother I've ever known. And like, I would never betray you and I would never betray my best friend's mother. Oh, and so all the women are sort of hugging and they're like, oh, I love you. I love you. I love you. Okay. Um, I know that no, 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 she's a mother of both. Can we say, can we adore her too much? Can we love Hippolyta too much? Oh, my lovely children, said the touched Hippolyta. Your tenderness overpowers me, but I must not give way to it. It is not ours to make election for ourselves. She's like, we can't make our own decisions. No, heaven, our fathers, and our husbands must decide for us. Wow, she's really deep in this, huh? She deep. She subscribes to the patriarchy here. 
Have patience until you hear what Manfred and Frederick have determined. If the Marquis, this is Frederick, Vicenza, accepts Matilda's hand, I know she will readily obey. <laughs> Heaven may interpose and prevent the rest. Wait, what means my child? Continued C, seeing Matilda fall at her feet with a flood of speechless tears. But no, answer me not, my daughter. I must not hear a word against the pleasure of thy father. Oh, so she's like, oh, one, you'll marry, you'll marry Frederick. And then Matilda starts crying and she's like, stop crying. You can't disobey your father. Oh, doubt not my obedience, my dreadful obedience to him and you. She calls it her, my dreadful obedience. She's like, I hate, I, I hate how obedient I am. But can I, most respective women, can I experience all this tenderness, this world of goodness and conceal a thought from the best of mothers? Oh, what art thou going to utter, said Isabella, trembling. Recollect thyself, Matilda. No, Isabella, said the princess. God, this, I wish they used quotation marks. I should not deserve this incomparable parent if the inmost recess of my soul harbored a thought without her permission. She's like, Ugh, even my deep thoughts need her permission. Nay, I have offended her. I have suffered a passion to enter my heart without her avowals. She's like, I have let myself fall in love without getting my mom's approval. But here I disclaim it. I vow to heaven in her. My child, my child, said Hippolyta. What words are these? What new calamities has fate in store for us? Thou, a passion, thou in this honor of disc She's like, you've fallen in love now? You've chosen now as a time to fall in love with Theo? Oh, I see my guilt, said Matilda. I abhor myself. I hate myself. If I cost my mother a pang, she is the dearest thing on earth. I have on earth. Oh, I will never, never behold him more. She's like, I'll never see Theo again. All right, so... This is, you know, continues on and on. Um, but this is a this is a brutal scene, right? How how deeply are they affected by this idea of obedience? Anyway, moving on. So, um let's let's turn to the men here. Of course, we've got Ma Manfred in the meantime had broken his purpose to Frederick. He's like I proposed the double marriage. What do you think about this, Fred? That weak prince who had been struck with the charms of Matilda listened but too eagerly to the author, to the offer. He forgot his hatred, his enmity to Manfred, whom he saw but little hope of dispossessing by force. He's like, I don't think I can actually take the throne, to be honest with you. Um, and flattering himself that no issue might succeed from the union of his daughter with the tyrant, he lo he's like, oh, they're not going to have a kid anyway. He looked upon his own succession to the principality as facilitated by wedding Matilda. He's like, I could be the prince of Otranto. He made faint opposition, so he pretended to oppose it, affecting for formally not to acquiesce unless Hippolyta should consent to the divorce. So he's like, okay, but only if your wife, you will have the double wedding, only if uh, everyone wants to get divorced. And then Hippolyta shows up. Madam, said Manfred, what business drew you hither? Hither means to hear. Why did you not await my return from the Marquis? I came to implore a blessing on your count. Oh, this is her talking. God, no quotation marks. I came to implore, ask for a blessing on your counsels, replied Hippolyta. My counsels do not need a friar's intervention, said Manfred. And of all men living is the hoary traitor, the only one whom you delight to confer with. He's like, why do you love the priest so much? Oh, she secretly wants to go live with the priest. Profane prince. Oh, Jerome's there. I forgot. Profane prince, said Jerome. So, like, Manfred's talking smack about, you know, Father Jerome here. Profane prince, said Jerome. Is it at the altar that thou choosest to insult the servants of the altar? But, Manfred, thy impious schemes are known. Heaven and this virtuous lady know them. So, look, like, Jerome's sort of implying that, you know, Hippolyta, like, secretly knows what's what. Now, do we believe that? I don't know. We have some evidence here and there, though. She she keeps, like, proposing to become a nun get, and get away from all this mess. And I, I suspect, my suspicion is that Hippolyta's playing a game here, but, you know, you could argue either way. Nay, frown not, prince. The, the church despises thy menaces. Her thunders will be heard above thy wrath. All right, so let's skip ahead. Thou art no lawful prince, said Jerome. Go, thou art no prince. Go discuss thy claim with Frederick, and when that is done, it is done, replied Manfred. Frederick accepts Matilda's hand and is, con is content to waive his claim. So, so they've agreed. Double marriage it is. 
Um, and Frederick is decided he's content to waive his claim to the castle, unless I have no male issue. And it's, so if Frederick and uh, if Manfred and Isabella don't have a male heir, then Frederick can have Otranto. Okay, this I want. This is the part I wanted you to see. As he spoke those words, three drops of blood fell from the nose of Alfonso's statue. So this is the big nosebleed scene. Like, just as Manfred's saying, uh, okay, so those, this feud is off. Um, we're going to just continue on and get this double marriage. Old men with young ladies, young daughter figures underway. Alfonso's statue is like, hell no, um, I object, and he expresses that by having a bloody nose. His statue has a bloody nose. And then at this, Man Manfred respects the supernatural occurrences, right? Manfred turned pale, and the princess sunk on her knees. Behold, said the friar, mark this miraculous indication of the blood of Alfonso will never mix with that of Manfred. All right, so got it. Um, moving on, chapter five. This is when, then they, they, but then they resume their, their attempt to have the double marriage. So here we are, page 97, flipping ahead. Um, Fre Frederick, so they've been drinking, been at a banquet. And Frederick's like, oh, I'm going to go check out Hippolyta. Maybe I can convince her to do the divorce so we can have the double young lady marriage. And so Frederick inquired if Hippolyta was alone. Yeah, it's a little creepy. Um, and they're like, oh, she's praying as usual. So he goes into her little chamber. You know, men and women, the the rich, the aristocrats back then, like, they didn't have the same bedroom necessarily. They would have their own apartments, these princes. Um, all right, the Marquis, this is Frederick, was not surprised at the silence that reigned in the princess's apartment. He's like, oh yeah, duh, she's praying. So he goes in and pushing the door open oh, gently, he saw a person kneeling before the altar. As he approached near, it seemed not a woman, but one in a long woolen weed, meaning like sort of threadbare jacket, long jacket, who was back was toward him. The person seemed absorbed in prayer. The marquee was about to return when the figure rising stood some moments fixed in meditation without regarding him. The Marquis, expecting the holy person to come forth, meaning to excuse his uncivil interruption, said, Reverend Father, I sought the lady, Hippolyta. Hippolyta, replied a hollow voice, came thou to this castle to speak, seek Hippolyta. And then the figure, turning slowly, top of page 98, turning slowly round, discovered to Frederick the fleshless jaws and empty sockets of a skeleton wrapped in a hermit's cowl. Angels of grace, protect me, cried Frederick. So here's Frederick, you know, trying to be creepy and marry Hippolyta's daughter and convince Hippolyta divorce, to divorce her husband so that he can marry his daughter. I mean, you know, the, the skeletons and goats are preventing this from happening. Okay, so the holy hermit that Frederick had encountered before, remember that? That was, this is the ghost of that hermit or a hermit is like a monk who lives alone okay so frederick now feels bad we're gonna skip ahead um uh so where are we here um All right, so we've got an encounter coming up. Um, Manfred, whose spirits were inflamed, remember they're all drunk and upset, and whom Isabella had driven from her on his urging his passion with too little reserve, did not doubt but the inquietude she had expressed had been occasioned by her impatience to meet Theodore. He's like, the only explanation for which she would reject me is that Isabella is actually in love with Theodore. Provoked by this conjecture and enraged at her father, he hastened secretly to the great church. So they're going to church, the sacred holy place. Gliding softly between the aisles and guided by an imperfect gleam of moonshine that shone faintly through the... This is very gothic, right? 
that shone faintly through the illuminated windows, he stole toward the tomb of Alfonso, to which he was directed by indistinct whispers of the persons he thought. So he sees a couple people, thinks it's Isabella um, and Theodore, and they're whispering up at the front. The first sounds he could distinguish were, so this is what he overhears, does it, alas, depend on me? Manfred will never permit our union. Oh, so that's like, Matilda's like, mm, Manfred will never let us get married. My dad will never let us get married. No, this shall prevent it, cried the tyrant, drawing his dagger and plunging it over her shoulder into the, oh, I guess that this was Theodore speaking. God, it's hard to tell. Plunging her, it, her sh plunging it over her shoulder into the bosom of the person that spoke. Ah, me, cried Matilda, sinking. Good heaven, receive my soul. Savage, inhuman monster, what hast thou done? cried Theodore, rushing on him, wrenching his dagger from him. Stop, stop, thy impious hand, cried Matilda. It is my father. Okay, check this out. So Matilda gets stabbed by her father, and Theodore, like, attacks him, taking his, fa his uh, dagger away. And then what's Matilda's reaction? You're being irreligious. You're sta you're you're attacking my dad. He just stabbed you, Matilda. Manfred, waking as from a trance, beat his breast, twisted his hands in his locks, that means his hair, and endeavored to recover his dagger from Theodore to dispatch himself. So Manfred tries to take the dagger back so he can kill himself. He's realized he's made a mistake. There Theodore, less scarce less distracted and only mastering the transports of his grief to assist Matilda had by now his cries drawn some of the monks to his aid. While part of them endeavored in concert with the afflicted theater to stop the blood of the dying princess, the rest prevented Manfred from laying violent hands on himself. So they're trying to save the princess, they're trying to prevent Manfred from committing suicide. And then Jerome has the last word here. Now, tyrant, behold the completion of woe fulfilled on thy impious and devoted head. The blood of Alfonso cried to heaven for vengeance, and heaven has permitted its altar to be polluted by assassination. Literally, Matilda has been killed at the altar of the church. That thou must shed, might, might, mightest shed thy own blood at the foot of that prince's sepulchre. Cruel man, cried Matilda, to aggravate the woes of the parent. She's yelling at that father jerome she's like my may heaven bless my father and forgive him as i do she's like he already is sad because his child is dying don't make it worse um my lord my gracious sire dost thou forgive thy child she's like do you forgive me dad indeed i came not hither to meet theodore i found him praying at this tomb she's like i didn't come here on purpose to meet him whether my mom sent me to intercede for thee, for her. Dearest father, bless your child and say you forgive her. She's asking her dad, who just stayed, uh, stabbed her, for forgiveness. Forgive thee, murderous monster, cried Manfred. Can assassins forgive? I took thee for Isabella, but heaven directed my bloody hand to the heart of my child. Oh, Matilda, I cannot utter it. Canst thou forgive the blindness of my rage? I can, I do, and may heaven confirm it, said Matilda. But while I have life to ask it, oh, my mother, what will she feel? Will you comfort her, my lord? Will you not? He's like... Okay, so, you know, they're, and then they try to, like, uh, they're going to try to, Theo wants to marry her before she dies. If this reminds you of uh, Romeo and Juliet, you're correct. It is just like that. Remember, they have a sort of meeting arranged at a tomb, and um, Juliet is lying uh she drank this poison to make herself look dead and then Romeo comes and thinks she's actually dead so he like kills himself but then that's right when she wakes up from the poison and then she's and then he dies and then she kills herself remember that at the end of Romeo and Juliet that's kind of what's happening here because their parents were unfair and mean um they both die so Isabella, in the meantime, was accompanying the afflicted Hippolyta to her apartment, but in the middle of the court they were met by Manfred, who, distracted with his own thoughts and anxious once more to behold his daughter, was advancing to the chamber where she lay. He's like, I need to see, I need to see her. As the moon was now at its height, he read in the countenances the faces of this unhappy company the event he dreaded. What? Is she dead? He cried he in a wild confusion. A clap of thunder at that instant shook the ca castle to the, its foundations. The earth rocked and the clank of more than mortal armor was heard behind. So they can hear the, the knight. 
Frederick and Jerome thought the last day was at hand. They thought the world was ending. The latter, Jerome, forcing Theodore among, along with them, rushed into the court. The moment Theodore appeared, the walls of the castle behind Manfred were thrown down with a mighty force in the form of Alfonso, dilated, I mean, like, expanded, to an immense magnitude appeared in the center of the ruins. Behold in Theodore, the true heir of Alfonso, said the vision, and having pronounced those words, accompanied by a clap of thunder, it ascended, Alfonso is an it here, toward heaven, where the clouding parts, clou clouding, clouds parting asunder, the form of St. Nicholas was seen and receiving Alfonso's shade. Shade is like an old-fashioned term for ghost. They were soon wrapped from mortal eyes in a blaze of glory. The beholders fell prostrate on their faces, so everyone falls on their face, acknowledging the divine will. The first that bro broke the silence was Hippolyta. My lord, said she to the desponding man, behold the vanity of human greatness. Conrad is gone, Matilda is no more. In Theodore we view the true prince of Otranto. By what miracle he is so, I know not. So she's like, I don't know how this is true, but it must be true. And then um, Manfred's like... To heap shame, he's like, I'll tell you the truth now. To heap shame on my own head is all the satisfaction I have left to offer offended heaven. He's like, all I have left to offer is my own shame. So I'll tell the story. Ah, what can atone for usurpation and a murdered child? He's like, nothing can make up for what I've done. Um, but then he explains uh, that his grandfather, Don Ricardo, had... Uh, not been a legitimate heir. And then um, Jerome explains that the daughter of which Victoria was delivered, Victoria was Alfonso's secret wife. His daughter was in her maturity bestowed in marriage upon me. He's like, that was my, my wife. That's my wife. And um, that's Theodore's mom. So that he's like, that's how Theodore is related to Alfonso. And this is the very ending. It's very sad. The friar ceased. The disconsolate, upset company retired to the remaining part of the castle. Remember, the castle kind of destroyed itself there. Part of it. In the morning, Manfred signed his abdication of the principality, meaning he like signed over the deed of the castle with the appro approbation, with the approval of Hippolyta. And each of them took on, each of each took on them the habit of religion in the neighboring convents. So they both entered the monastery and the nunnery. They took on the habit, meaning wore the clothes of monks and nuns. Frederick offered his daughter to the new prince. So he's like, well, Matilda, you can marry the prince of Otranto. Which Hippolyta's tenderness for Isabella concurred to promote. She agreed. But Theodore's grief was too fresh to admit the thought of another love. And it was not till after frequent discourses with Isabella, not until they had talked a lot, of his dear Matilda, that he was persuaded he could know no happiness but in the society of one with whom he could forever indulge the melancholy that had taken possession of his soul. So basically, he finally agrees to marry Matilda, or to marry Isabella, because she's the only one with whom he could forever indulge the melancholy so melancholy is such an important word in the Gothic, right? Melancholy is like sort of sweet sadness. It's what Thomas Gray's enjoying in that graveyard. So he can like indulge or um, spend a lot of time with the sadness about it, about his sadness about the loss of Matilda. He and Isabella can enjoy that sadness together. They're gonna be sad together. It's very they're very like emo. This is the emo ending. We'll be sad together. So thus we conclude the castle of Otranto. Um, we have the proper prince now as the, the prince of Otranto. And um, all the bad guys are, well, the worst guy, Manfred, he's now a monk. Matilda is dead. And I hope you've enjoyed this ridiculous book as much as I have. <laughs>